There are 63 tombs in Egypt's Valley of the Kings. But the only tomb which gave us the idea about the royal tomb in ancient Egypt is King Tut's tomb, Tutankhamun. It was the only one to be found intact so far. It's here inside the tomb of Tutankhamun where you find the only mummy in all Luxor's Valley of Kings. There he lies where it's been for thousands of years. Unlike the surrounding air that's in the tomb, which has 21% oxygen, the air inside the case is nitrogen with very little oxygen. Vincent Beltran is an associate scientist at the Getty Conservation Institute in California working to preserve cultural heritage sites around the world. His team is in charge of this thing. What is the weather station that's up there? Oh, so that's why they are keep keeping it from humidity. The air down here has to be constantly filtered. This tiny tomb has been open for 100 years now and is still as popular as ever with tourists. They're breathing in the tomb. Their body temperature changes temperature and humidity inside the tomb. They bring dust inside the tomb on their clothes and on their shoes. And you know, that dust deposits on the wall painting. Sarah Lardinoy tells us the still brilliant reds and yellows are made from two types of iron oxides painted onto the plastered walls. Those brown spots you see here are a dead fungus from the 18th dynasty that hasn't grown in any other tomb here. Oh wow, look at that. Most likely because the boy Pharaoh died suddenly at 19 and his burial chamber was a rush job. And they really couldn't be removed without causing damage to the wall paintings. So they remain and they're part of the history of this tomb. Most of the year there is natural airflow here, but in the summer months when the average high are above 100 degrees Fahrenheit and have been known to approach 120 degrees, all that dust used to accumulate inside. But now this modern expert team is creating a stable atmosphere to protect King Tut's burial chamber, just like an ancient Egyptian god would have done. And there he is, Anubis, the jackal-headed god of mummification. The guy who made all this possible, according to the ancient Egyptians, standing next to the famous King Tut, Dave Balcom. And welcome to the Pattern Streaming Channel. Uh, there's so much more to this story about uh, King Tut's tomb, Valley of Kings, Egypt, all that uh, that we couldn't get to on television. But here we have so much more time. There's so much that goes into these stories, and I find it fascinating. So why don't we take a look at the full interview with the scientists you heard from, both Vincent and Sarah, and also some of their video that they had from Getty as well. If you were to make a list of the most important archaeological discoveries in human history, certainly the discovery of King Tut's tomb ranks up at the very top. King Tut, the golden boy, the boy that he ruled Egypt in the age of nine, and he died in the age of 19. Nothing captured the imagination of the general public as much as King Tut's tomb did. And it has never stopped being among the most popular archaeological sites of all time. King Tut has magic, mystery. This tomb is unique. When you enter inside, it captures your hearts. Tutankhamun's tomb has just been the focus of so much attention since its discovery. It was felt that the tomb was under threat. There were just millions of visitors coming to King's Valley, so it was a concern of the Egyptian authorities. There has been a persistent, perceived problem with the brown spots, with the fungus spots. It's pretty clear that uh, things were left unfinished. So that's been the nature of the Gettys project to, to tackle some of those issues. The weather station, which is up above the tomb, has been erected since I think around two, 2009. Um, and the goal of the project at the GCI was to understand and manage the conservations of the Tutankhamun tomb. In order to do this, we really need to understand how uh, the interior of the tomb interacts with the exterior environment, as well as the impact of large numbers of visitors to the tomb. So the weather station provides us with this crucial information about things like temperature, 
relative humidity, carbon dioxide, in order to support our evidence-based decision-making on what types of strategies to employ inside the tomb. And, and in fact, environmental monitoring has, has been a key component for many of the projects at the Getty Conservation Institute. And Sarah, when, when, you, when you go inside there, you see these dots um, on, the, on the one uh, section that's painted. Why does that not occur anywhere else in the Valley of the Kings? I mean, I have to say, we don't know for certain as to why this one tomb has the brown spots and the others do not. Um, you know, but the features of the tomb indicate that it was a ha hasty adaptation of a pre-existing tomb for Tutankhamun's burial after his early death. So some people think this may have something to do with it. What we do know for certain is that the brown spots were present on the wall paintings when Carter discovered the tomb in 1922. And when we've compared photos of the wall paintings taken in the 1920s with the current conditions, you know, we see that the brown spots have not changed in size or distribution. You know, our project team undertook DNA and chemical analyses of the brown spots and the testing confirmed the spots to be microbiological in origin, but dead and thus no longer a threat to the wall paintings. But still, you know, these spots, they had penetrated the paint layers and they really couldn't be removed without causing damage to the wall paintings. So they remain and they're part of the history of this tomb. We used microscopy, so using a handheld microscope connected to a computer, we were able to look in great detail about the different layers that make up the painting. We did a technical imaging campaign. So this is looking at the paintings under different light sources, so ultraviolet, infrared. Uh, this allows us to understand the materials because the different materials will respond differently under different light sources. The tomb suffered from some spots that no one never know why these spots occurred in the tomb. This is unusual. We have no other tomb that we know of that has this issue with microbiological growth. So, I mean, why is that? And I don't think we, we know 100%, but it could very well be because of the circumstances of the burial, that there's something about the conditions of this tomb that makes it different, makes it unique from other tombs that survive in Egypt. So I think there's also some argument that could be made that one, one should preserve the archeological significance <laughs> of these spots. This photograph is, doesn't have, it's that one down there. Just looking at this and looking at, uh, at that one there, there's absolutely no difference visually between... Part the of the microbiological investigation that was undertaken in the tomb was to take the high-resolution photographs that were done at the time of excavation by Carter. We printed those out one-to-one -one scale and actually went in and compared those images yeah. with the brown spots today. The tragedy is that they ignored the fundamental evidence that was available, yeah. the photographic record from the past. Simply putting the one against the other, you could see that there was no change. What is their interaction with the surfaces below? Can they be removed? And what we found is that they actually grow into the paint layer. So it is impossible to remove the brown spots without damaging the paintings. So for us, there's, there's no question, we cannot remove them. It's not progressing at all. Um, the penetration of the spots in the painting had already been there from the start. So of course our paintings are, are probably looking at a two-dimensional perspective, but it's clear that even from that two-dimensional perspective, there has no been, that there hasn't been any spread of those, of those spots. Sarah, I, I imagine you can elaborate on that point. The DNA analysis and the um, other biological analyses, you know, showed that they're not vi it's not viable anymore. There's nothing more that's continuing to progress. Is it still alive? No. no. So there's no zombie fungus in the tomb or anything like that? <laughs> Unfortunately not. <laughs> when you look at the, the tomb itself, it's obviously a... Uh, a huge tourist attraction being one of the greatest archaeological finds in human history. Uh, do you get a lot of people coming in there and uh, just by just by being inside the tomb, does that cause any kind of damage? So the tomb of, of Tutankhamun is quite unusual 
compared to the other tombs in the Valley of the Kings. As you stated, Dave, the tourism is very large. So you have a large number of visitors. Com compounding that is the fact that the tomb is very small compared to other tombs in the Valley of the Kings. So those two factors create a deterioration situation that really isn't present in some of the other places in the tomb. And, and that's really what we were trying to mitigate in this, in this project. I was just gonna add to that. I mean, we know that when visitors come into the tomb, you know, they're, they, they're breathing in the tomb. So, and their body temperature, and you know, they, 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 they contribute to possibly changes in temperature and humidity inside the tomb. We also know that they bring dust inside the tomb on their clothes and on their shoes. And you know, that dust deposits on the wall paintings. You know, visitors also, in addition to these things, have the potential to cause mechanical damage to the wall paintings. You know, they might inadvertently touch a wall painting and just that human touch, um, you know, can do damage to the archeological fabric. So I would say in addition to looking at their impact on the, the environment in terms of temperature and humidity, we're also looking at other ways that they impact the tomb and how we can mitigate that through you know, in, uh, uh, new infrastructure in the tomb, which as an architect on the project, you know, I worked on barriers in the tomb that are, and routing and these kinds of things and measures to help take dust off of people's clothes before they come into the tomb. Adding a filter to the ventilation system to help filter out the dust. There's the graffiti, modern. Mm -hmm. There's uh, physical damage due to film crews who come in with uh, cables and lights and in a great hurry and do damage as well. There's the issue of dust intrusion into the tomb coming in in association with visitors on their clothes, on their shoes. And then there are potential indirect effects in terms of altering temperature, humidity, raising humidity levels and the impact on the delicate original technology of the paintings. The installation of the new ventilation system was designed to prevent this. So when visitors come into the tomb, we have installed a push-pull system so that we are actually bringing in filtered air and then extracting that. So the idea is that any air that is being brought in when visitors come in is now being filtered so that we are not encouraging as much dust from entering the tomb. The first part of the project really was to understand the relationship between the subterranean tomb, the exterior environment, and the human visitation. Um, so one of the key results that we found was there's um, a, a lack of infiltration from the exterior happening during the warm summer months. This is simply because the air outside the tomb is so warm um, that it isn't able to uh, descend into the tomb and have this natural infiltration of fresh air um, coming from the outside into the tomb. As a result, what happens is during those summer months when visitation is happening inside the tomb, there isn't this natural flushing event happening. And you're allowed to have an accumulation of moisture and accumulation of carbon dioxide in this tomb um, that you don't have in other parts of the year. So simply the, the, the recognition of these temporal events happening inside the tomb are key to um, decide what type of strategies to employ. Probably the most important individual on a modern archaeological excavation in Egypt is not the philologist, not the art historian, not the architect, but the conservator. And the reason for that is fairly simple. The job of the conservator on site is to protect and preserve these monuments so that they can be photographed, recorded, studied. All of these objects have to be protected because they are the results of an excavation that by the very definition of archaeology has destroyed an archaeological site in the process of digging it up. The thing about conservation is it has to be meticulous, it has to be precise. It's, there's no room for sloppiness. In the past, dust would enter freely into the tomb and this would deposit onto the wall paintings, necessitating frequent cleaning events of the wall paintings in order for it to aesthetically look um, uh, good for the visitors. Um, but every time you clean that painting, you're going to take off small fragments of paint. 
So by producing the necessity of cleaning, by producing the load of dust coming to the tomb, we're able to protect the paintings by producing the frictional abrasions that happen during cleaning. You know, the humidity is affecting the mummies. So here in, the, in this tomb, we're having the mummy of King Tut. So they, were, they are needing this to, to measure the humidity and also nitrogen, because using the nitrogen to keep the mummy in very good conditions. So this is not just for the wind. The mummy of uh, King Tutankhamun is the only one remaining in the Valley of the Kings. And its placement inside this um, case um, supports its long-term preservation. Unlike the surrounding air that's in the tomb, which has 21% oxygen, the air inside the case is oxygen-free. Um, and as a result, the environment in, around the mummy case produces a potential for oxidative and biologic reactions, which are common deterior me deterioration mechanisms from many organic objects. Um, it's nitrogen with very little oxygen. And I should say that the case that is inside the tomb isn't one that was designed by the Getty Conservation Institute. It was designed by a commercial company. But the Getty Conservation Institute has long been involved in the application of low oxygen environments for the display of heritage objects. Um, and a number of, of the objects that the GCI has been involved in in terms of encasing low oxygen environments has been the Declaration of Arbroath in Scotland, the Constitution of India, and also the Royal Mummy Collection in Cairo when it was previously housed at the Egyptian Museum. One of the things, you know, this project demonstrates is, you know, the potential for conservation investigation and research to yield new information. For instance, you know, in this case, we had, you know, really unprecedented studies that were undertaken on the wall paintings in Tut's tomb. And through the process, you know, we learned a lot about the materials that were used for the wall paintings and the techniques that were used. So that's one thing I think that is really exciting for us in the conservation profession is how conservation can inform understanding of archaeology. And that also, you know, we feel like this project can be a good model in terms of the processes that can be used to undertake other conservation projects. You know, all of the things that we implemented in Tut, you know, they might not be applicable to other tombs because Tut's smaller, it has high rates of visitation, the environment in there is going to be different than maybe in other tombs. But this process of undertaking the historic research, undertaking the scientific investigations, really understanding that history, the existing conditions in the tomb, understanding the deterioration mechanisms, and doing all of that before you design a conservation strategy to implement. Um, so for us, you know, that's a, we believe that's a great contribution of the project. Objects that we get out of that site are only as useful to us as the context that we have recorded them having been found in, only useful to us, if we have recorded, cleaned, and conserved them in a way that future generations can learn from them and study them and restudy them. There are probably uh, as many as 20 different people and uh, uh, at least a dozen or so specialties, scientific, war paintings, conservation, environmental, environmental monitoring, uh, uh, documentarian, uh, photographic uh, librarians who've missed so, uh, a lot of people. Uh, and that's the wonderful thing about it because it creates a, an extraordinary esprit de corps in which uh, we're all working towards a, a, a common goal and there's the, the excitement and uh, there's a challenge of discovery uh, and there's the excitement of, uh, of actually making discoveries and putting, it, putting the pieces together. We're entering the tomb of Ramses I on the west bank of the Nile in Luxor. And oh my goodness, look at the colors of the walls. And this is all original. Uh, there are no treasures in here because the treasures have been either stolen or brought to the museums that are in Cairo, which is an hour flight from here. This is Ramses the First sarcophagus. There's only one, one tomb here 
that has a weather station on it. And that's the tomb, of course, of Tutankhamun. I have a question for you, for you, Dave. So since you recently visited, how crowded was it in the tomb and in the Valley of the Kings? I heard tourism has gotten in, increased, in, increased recently. Not that crowded inside the uh, the Tut tomb. There was no wait. Um, the only one that we got kicked out of was Valley of the Queens in in, um, in Nefertari, which has a ten minute limit. Ooh. Wow. Nito. Ooh, Anubis. Wow. Anubis. 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 Well, I would think you're lucky because uh, we were actually there prior to COP. Um, for the the hundredth bicentennial celebrations, and there was a symposium. And on the days we were at the tomb, checking on the uh, you know weather station and changing the filters in the ventilation system, I had not seen lines like that in quite a long time. But we, I mean, we also know that visitation patterns change throughout the day. It tends to be heavier in the morning. Some, sometimes lighter midday and then picks up later in the afternoon. We also know it can change depending on the day of the week and kind of what the tour tour schedules are. Well, you might not know that the you were speaking about the tomb of Nefertari. This was one of the first field projects of the Getty Conservation Institute in the early, I think the work was done in the early 90s, Vincent. Does that sound right. right? Yeah, it's really, it, that one is really something spectacular. Oh. Thank you so much, Vincent and Sarah, for lending your expertise to what is an ongoing fascination of mine and so many other people around the world. Thank you for your time, Dave. It's been great to speak with you about this project. I think both of us have really um, enjoyed working on it and you know, with the great team of people in the U.S. and Egypt on it. Mm -hmm.